so I'll just kick off by saying, you know, I'm Keith Taylor. I'm a professor of cooperative extension at University of California, Davis. Um, in my role, I work on economic development at the state level. I, unlike my other colleagues who are professors on campus, I'm a professor in the community. So me being a Midwesterner, getting hired out here in 2017, I have this amazing job where I get paid to travel all over California to work with local communities on economic change. It is one of the coolest gigs you could ever have, I think. Um, and with that, you know, I'll say we are in California, we actually got a major budget increase and we're expanding a bunch of jobs in this space. So if you know of any folks that are looking to work in economic development in academia, make sure they're looking at the website for all these jobs. Um, so today, uh, what, I'm, what I'm wanting to present is, <laughs> I love this software, it's great. Um, so today, uh, you know, I was just telling Connor that uh, this particular presentation is something that's been in perpetual beta for me. Um, what I observe in my own work whenever I go out to communities of all kinds, whether it's digital, whether it's urban, rural, whatever, uh, folks are trying to get a hold of their economic future. And they have these perceptions of how to do that through shaping their vision through a corporate form. And I find that people have a caricature-ish vision of what the corporate form is supposed to be. And you'll see here that I give a lot of nuance in this presentation around that. So what I want to say is in, in the spirit of that, this being a perpetual beta, I want you all to feel like you can interrupt me if you want to you know, uh, provide some insights, if you want to ask some questions. This is both a lecture and a conversation, a facilitation all at once. Uh, I want us all to get to know each other. I want us all to share ideas. Um, yeah, I, I think I can see it. I can see the chat right now, Ben. And I think that whenever I do the share screen, I think I'll be able to see it too. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about too is, uh, you know, just whenever, if you do interrupt, uh, just be mindful of other folks. Other folks probably do want to see the presentation and all that. So just be mindful of time and, you know, courtesy of other folks in the room. Uh, but otherwise, uh, with that, what I would like to do, uh, Connor, are we able to queue people up to allow them to introduce themselves before I hop into this? Yeah, um, that's going to, so it'll automatically create a queue when you click click to speak. So um, if we want to do introductions, um, just uh, we'll need participants to go ahead and click that click to speak at the bottom there, and that should automatically drop people into a queue. Excellent. I'd just ask participants to do that real quick, if you wouldn't mind. So just want to kind of know who you are, what you do, and why you showed up to this room in particular. And again, we will not be able to hear anything that anyone is saying unless they first click on the click to speak at the bottom of the screen. Looks like Matt has popped in there now. Welcome. Matt, would you like to say a word? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm a core team member at PleaserDAO. And as part of my work at PleaserDAO, I helped launch two DAOs, Free Ross DAO and Ukraine DAO. And I've just kind of seen um, a lot of difficulties with um, kind of creating a DAO and just handing it off to community. Uh, so I felt like this topic is um, really crucial. And yeah, I'm excited for this. That's cool, Matt. I, I really like that perspective because I think a lot of folks, I, folks that have a, a good heart, really want the stakeholders to participate and self-govern. But one of the things that a lot of folks don't understand is not everyone wants to self-govern or they have the capabilities. And figuring out how we onboard people, I think, is a real challenge with kind of social purpose firms and this sort of thing. So I like that you're already bringing that up. Uh, I think I see up next is Amy. Hi, yeah, I'm Amy. Um, so my background's in design and community um, or design as, as well. Um, so I was with Maker DAO, and we kind of helped um, go from kind of like this closed organization to the DAO that is 
kind of today. Um, so I'm interested in sort of management and governance in general, because this is a new form of organization that I really believe we're, we're going to um, move into. So I'm excited to just like hear more about um, this lecture. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. And I see Abby mentioned that my audio is breaking up. I think Connor mentioned earlier that when I sit back, it might break up a little bit. So I'll do my best to lean in so it doesn't mess with my audio. Let's go with uh, Ben next. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Ben. Nice to see and meet you all. Um, I work at a project called Optimism. Um, and we've got a big old blockchain that we want to be governed by the community. And particularly, we want to be governed by a set of individuals um, represented by soulbound tokens, one person, one vote. Um, so it's very much, you know, a sort of public good or protocol. I don't know if it's technically public good by the super legit academic terms, but um, it's a very important thing. That's a scarce resource that we want everyone to share and the community to govern. Ben, you know, it, we can talk offline, but uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the types of goods that are out there. And if you go to Eleanor Ostrom's work, she would talk about the bundle of goods typology, which I think is more precise. So, yes. Uh, let's hop over to Scott next. Definitely agree with the bundle of goods concept. I think that um, for my part, we are also sort of in this weird public good space where we are aiming to build open source software um, as part of Gitcoin, um, which is sort of transitioned to being a DAO in the last year. Um, a lot of our governance, you know, is is meant to be community owned, but to your point, it is sometimes challenging to keep engagement up and like make sure that there is wide range participation from like a large group of stakeholders. So definitely interested in just, you know, exploring that topic and um in general figuring out um how to evolve uh that governance model cool scott you know um you'll see in the presentation i kind of take a dive into the electric cooperatives in the united states and uh, they have challenges with engagement as well and a lot of folks can be critical of that uh but the issue there is that if you have thirty thousand members how are you supposed to have all thirty thousand people participating when you have a staff of maybe 20 for example um, so there's all kinds of interesting things that are out there and how people can mix and match participation and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I, um, when we get to that part, it'll be interesting what right? you have to say. Um, seems like Abby's having some technical difficulties, so I think she's going to be back here. Uh, Devin. Hi. Um, so I am working on a, a proposal right now. It's in a proposal format to create um, what will become the Uniswap Foundation. So a foundation governing um, this open source DeFi primitive, which we're very excited excited about. And one of our the one of our missions is to reinvigorate the governance process for Uniswap because there has been a lot of friction in, in that process, and it's been difficult. Um, for folks to, or we haven't seen as much engaged participation from a wide array of folks as, as we think um, would support the kind of, you know, long-term sustainability of, of the infrastructure that we would like to see. So I'm, um, yeah, we, it, I think it'll be a big effort to take on. And I think, um, you know, learning from, from you and, and others on, you know, best practices and ways to think about um, incentivizing engaged uh, participation is, is something I'm really excited to do. Cool. Uh, I don't know if Abby's come back on yet, uh, but whenever Abby's back, uh, we'll let Abby introduce. Um, but otherwise, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll start the presentation. Like I said, feel free to raise your hand throughout. Um, this is, like I said, perpetual beta, so you're helping me improve this. So any constructive criticism I'm happy with, uh, please do. Is also mine. Is mine working? Oh. Sorry, I didn't see. Is it? No, uh, I, was, I was having some tech difficulties too. Feel free to introduce yourself. Um, my name is Alex Zhang um, from Friends with Benefits. Um, my role there is is the mayor of FWB. And that um, sort of my main role is is that of a facilitator and helping identify different areas of the DAO and helping create and structure governance processes, um, proposal creation processes, etc. We're a social token. Um, in that uh, the sort of single fungible FWB 
token serves as the main sort of governance and membership mechanic um, to participate in the community and our myriad of activities. Cool. Is there anyone else that I've missed? So if no one raised uh, their hand. I'm Abby sorry. Is back. I'm not sure if Abby wants to um, step in and introduce herself again. Abby, if you're able to, that'd be great. So we can't um, we can't hear you unless you click on the click to speak at the bottom of the screen. Um, the while you're in this. Oh, there we go. Welcome back. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So sorry, this like software is really fucking up my computer. Um, but okay, um, mine, I'll be super quick. Um, so my name is Abby. Um, I uh, am at Radical. Radical is um, basically a free and open source project that's building uh, peer to peer collaboration tools. Um, and its uh, vision, kind of end goal, is to be a, a self sustaining, community owned, and operated uh, free and open source project. Um, and so I'm currently the head of community and governance there and am on the council as a radical foundation. Um, and my role right now is to basically steward the transition of the project to the DAO. What that means is to replace the foundation council um, with uh, decentralized decision-making entities that can allow for the continued maintenance development and growth of this open source project in the long term. So I would say that the governance that I'm interested in is very much so related to open source governance, which has been a around for um, a long time, yet also with the uh, nuance, which is uh, open source projects that actually have their own agency over uh, capital distribution instead of being reliant on like um, uh, institutions. And so that's kind of like the flavor of governance that I'm working in. Um, and I'm currently actively designing uh, the transition to the DAO, um, mainly focusing on like the organizational design, um, but also kind of stewarding um, different parts of that DAO as well. So. Sorry, I hope I can stay on for longer and I can figure out these issues, so. It's all good, Abby, this is great. Uh, let's see, so I'll get my screen share going. Uh, let's do screen share and window. All right. So as I said, you know, in the spirit of all this, uh, you know, it's conversational, feel free to, you know, chat or raise your hand if you want to voice something. Um, you, again, where I'm coming from here is I'm wanting folks to understand that as they're trying to impact social change in whatever way they can, uh, my kind of theory of change involves the use of corporate form. I think that the proper application of corporate form and then the devils in the details kind of stuff is something that's missing from a lot of social movements. Uh, if you think about it, 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 it often kind of comes back to, you know, I'm inspired by Eleanor Ostrom. I was actually a postdoc research associate at the Ostrom Workshop at Indiana University. She wrote a lot about governance, just amazing stuff. And I'll conclude this presentation talking about her briefly. But one of the things she would discuss is that oftentimes people would uh, devolve conversations down to just the government or just markets. And there's far more than just that in the institutional space. You know, there's civil society. There's also hybrid you know, what is just the market and what is just the government, for example, it blurs the lines in many ways. And you'll see I'm kind of alluding to that in this presentation here. So what I'm trying to do is increase people's sophistication around this area. And, uh, you know, again, this is perpetual beta. So I'm trying to make it where this is easier for the general public to understand. And then hopefully they can go into a deeper dive over time. And you'll see that I'm referring to some institutions that have increased everyday people's capacity to do this sort of thing. So with that, so, you know, I, I, what I, I think of all of y'all as is social entrepreneurs, really. Y'all are out there trying to impact things. And sure, some folks are here to make some good money and to have some social impact. There's other folks that just want to have social impact and so long as they can get by, then that's awesome. But I think that the question to ask yourself and to be very clear as you're going into these spaces is what's the mark that you're wanting to leave? 
And what are the values you bring with this? And what are you willing to sacrifice? You know, and that helps you think about the kind of corporate forms that you're wanting to engage with. And within that, then how you can uh, shape the governance as well. So, you know, I, I think a lot about political ideology in my work. I think that it's really important. Uh, it's funny, I'll get around economist types that will say ideology doesn't matter at all, but then there's some of the most ideological people I'll deal with. Uh, in my own exploration, I would say that I originally came at things from kind of a lefty social orientation. And uh, yeah, but, uh, and then uh, I really got turned on to libertarianism. And for me, I'm not a right libertarian. I'm more of a left anarcho libertarian. Uh, but you see that I come at this from this kind of community building orientation. Um, I believe in deep self-governance where we can do it. But self-governance is not something that comes natural. So I just kind of chunked this up into some of the things that I observe in the communities that I deal with, of the sort of ideologies that people play with me. This is what they usually come to the table with. They're either pro-market, libertarian, kind of Milton Friedman, like everything's about profit. There's the conscious capitalism crowd that's exemplified by John Mackey with Whole Foods. Uh, there's your public benefit crowd, which is going to be more your cooperatives and B Corps and this sort of thing. And then there's your left revolutionary anti-capitalist. Um, so here, I'm just moving my windows around here, y'all. So, you know, th there's some challenges here when you have some of these ideologies, just thinking about like, you know, what bubbles up and what to be self-aware of. I, I do think that a lot of the conscious capitalists, they, they sort of think that an investor-owned firm is going to be the best way because you can leverage capital. Uh, but can you really tame capital when capital has the main seat at the table? You know, when you think about a corporation, an investor-owned firm, who staffs the board? The board of directors ends up being he who has the most money, has the most voice. So taming capital is going to be very challenging if you're conscious capitalist having an investor-owned firm. The anti-institutionalist, which we're seeing some, from some right libertarians and some kind of uh, anti-capitalist types, I always think that there's some uh, ideology that comes into play that makes it hard to game the system, it's sort of like, I don't need to pay attention to the rules. I can do the move fast and break stuff sort of thing. But at the end of the day, there are still rules in play. And if folks that are the rules enforcers choose to do that, then they can come after you. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of power that's embedded in the systems that we all play with that. So I think that's key to strategizing how you want to do social change. And then there's the public benefit crowd, which is where I'm at. And I'm really trying to ramp that up in my own work. But there's not a lot of resources and not a lot of guidance out there. And I think that that's sort of what many folks in the DAO space are dealing with. Um, yeah, Matt, I like that. Um, so, you know, in the public benefit space, again, I'm grouping in a bunch of different kinds of corporate forms here. Nonprofits, cooperatives, B Corps, ESOPs, these sort of things. And when you go out and look for guidance, there's not a lot out there. I think that's one of my niches that I'm build, uh, building out as a junior faculty member in UC Davis. Uh, one of the books that I found to be super fascinating is called Reinventing Organizations. And the guy that wrote it is a former McKinsey and Company folks, uh, uh, a fellow. And um, if you go through and read it, you're like, wow, everything he's talking about here, he's looking at investor-owned firms that have done some social uh, uh, you know, impact stuff. But what happened is the moment there was a political crisis that occurred, the board circled the wagons and said, oh, you know, these social things you're doing here in the company, that's the problem. That's what we need to change. So you had an example of a tomato company in Florida that had more worker participation. The profits went up, the uh, uh, productivity went up. But what occurred was 2008 hit the economic crisis. And that was a structural issue. It wasn't internal to the firm. And they took a hit like everyone else did. The board came together and said, ah, oh, it's all that social change crap you guys are doing. And so they got rid of it, which is their value add. Their firm actually suffered the consequences. So this particular writer in reinventing organizations, like, how do we control for this? And I was kind of like, my dude, you're looking at the investor owned firm. You've got a board of directors that's driven by money. You're going to run into this challenge every time and you're not seriously engaging with that. So what do we know in this space? 
really not a lot is centralized to truth be told. And this community that I'm working with here, you all, um, you all are the knowledge brokers to bring all this together. So, you know, if you find that it's challenging to find centralized sources, you are correct. And I'm happy to talk more about that if you're wanting to look for other places and this sort of thing, but I'm just prefacing all that. So one thing though, I want to point out, you know, despite all that, the corporate form is actually incredibly flexible. Um, you know, just because I mentioned the investor-owned firm, it doesn't mean that in your own work, you should reject using the investor-owned firm. In fact, there are cooperatives that are legally structured as investor-owned firms. But in their bylaws, what they do is they set up their shareholders to be one member, one vote. You can do that. You can also then use co-op statutes. You can use nonprofit statutes to do all these things. So it's to say, like, once you start dipping your toe in this water, you go, oh, there's actually a ton of options for us to play with here. So I would say we're in this renaissance era of corporate instrument instrumentalization, whatever you want to say. Also, the other thing that's out there is it's an abundance of capital. There's so much money that's floating out there. There's so many people that want to do social impact investing. So it means we have more flexibility. In the past, the going idea was, how can we get someone to invest in our idea whenever they're going to want to have control with their money? That's not so true anymore. There are people that are wanting to show ESGs, environmental, social you know, governance goals. And, you know, if you can sell them on that and you actually have a good value proposition, maybe that's what you want to do. So, you know, there's this one movie that I, I myself really liked. It was the corporation and uh, the corporation basically structures it as the corporation is this evil, bad thing, and it's going to do all these terrible, you know, terrible stuff. And when you get in the kind of circles that I'm in, people then say things like co-ops. That's how we should do everything. Co-ops are always going to be good. I am someone who absolutely loves co-ops. It's why I research them. It's why I play with them. I was just at a conference in Minnesota, speaking to the Minnesota Rural Electric Co-op Association. Um, I can tell you there are good corporations and there are bad co-ops. I don't think that we should take a one size fits all on this. Um, I do think that to be skeptical of the ownership by capital is something to be concerned with. But you see companies like Costco that are taming some elements of the corporation. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, make sure I tee that up a little bit here. I want to give a bit of historical perspective on the corporation too. Um, there's a lot to appreciate how the corporate form has evolved over the years. Um, yeah, Matt, Minnesota has a wonderful co-op culture. It is amazing. It, even the rural and the red blue divide and all that kind of stuff, co-ops provide this really cool space in Minnesota for conversation. Um, so yeah, back to my slide here. Um, I just want to say, you know, corporations aren't organic entities. If you get around pro market types, they sort of act like a corporation is this natural thing that comes out of nowhere. It's almost like, you know, I'm 44. And when I grew up more, there was conversations around how the constitution was God given and this sort of thing. In our current environment where we're going more in the, this fascist right direction, um, people aren't saying that with the constitution anymore. Uh, but you hear this a lot with the corporation as if it just kind of came out of nowhere and it's a natural thing that's from the markets. It's not. Uh, you go back to uh, you know, Victorian England, and the corporation is an extension of the crown, of the monarchy. Essentially, the, uh, the monarchy did not want to do everything. So what they did is they, uh, they uh, provided a carve-out in the laws and rules for companies to go out and do things on behalf of the monarchy. Uh, this is where you have the uh, East Indies uh, Trading Company and these sort of things, right? Um so you can actually think of corporations as quasi-state institutions. I think that's what we need to be thinking of them as. They're not just there to generate money. They're there to influence how we govern society. So every time you create a new business, it's interjecting itself into our society, into our community, and influencing how things operate. Corporations also uh, are vehicles of industrialization. So you think about various status policies, 
in the United States, we had um, the American Manifest Destiny, westward expansion, this sort of thing. And the Transcontinental Railroad was a major part of that. We absolutely uh, delegated, I would say abdicated public policy to private investors. And they did this on behalf of state interest. But with that said, just because that had happened, it doesn't mean that we reject this. You know, it was, uh, um, you know, I think even Marx had noted that with capitalism, for example, that as it evolved, it provided a lot of goods in society for all of its downsides as well. And with that, we learn from these things. I think the same thing goes with the corporation too. So, you know, in terms of the evolution of the corporation, I'm sure many of you are aware of this. You know, there's the corporate personhood argument of should a corporation have these rights of personhood that came about with a controversial Supreme Court case in 1886. It applied the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And a lot of folks will say that it's completely gone off the rails since then. I think that's probably true, um, but that's not something I'm exploring too deeply in my work quite yet. Um, it's just something to be aware of as you think of these things. But then you think then it, how the corporation has evolved. When it came to the post-war era after World War II, you know, we had the, you know, the New Deal and we had the Marshall Plan. And it was this vast expansion of the state. You had counter movements from the right that were arising. And you think of kind of an anarcho-capitalism and libertarian uh, kind of things out there like Hayek. Uh, and these sort of thinkers. Uh, what they did is they viewed business and economics as a way to supplant the state, to squeeze it out, to uh, reduce democracy and to enhance the role of capital in controlling society. Uh, but there's also been this movement in recent years, I would say since the 2000s, of what I see as kind of more on the left, this left libertarianism or market socialism that's coming about. It's like maybe we can create more social purpose firms where we can offset the excesses of the state and the market. And this is going to give us more voice. So when government fails us, we have our own institutions that we can control. So give a little state what, what I see as the current state of corporate forms. You know, I think corporate forms are far more nuanced than what we give them credit for. You know, I've given some examples with Costco, for example. Uh, you know, Costco is what I would say uh, of the worst of the corporate firms are one of the best. Uh, I shop at Costco every two weeks. I get a lot of my, you know, just bulk meat and everything from there. Uh, Walmart is another example. I loathe Walmart myself. I'm from a rural community in central Illinois. My dad worked for a grocery store chain that got beaten up by Walmart coming into the community. But Walmart now has this footprint that allows them whenever they want to do things like just change the bulbs in all of their stores to LEDs. If they do that wholesale, it saves uh, the United States collectively on energy consumption, carbon emissions, and this sort of thing. Uh, so there's some trade-offs, some things we can learn from these things. But I also want to point out you know, there's this one co-op that not a lot of folks have heard about, American Crystal Sugar. Uh, it's out of North Dakota. I think it was about six years ago, they hired their new CEO. Their former CEO left making $800,000 a year in North Dakota, which is a very good income in North Dakota. It's a good income in California. Uh, the new CEO came in, I think he was making $3 million a year. And right away, what he started to do was to do union busting. So just because it's a co-op doesn't mean it's going to do great things. Uh, also, you look at REI. REI has been in the news lately for what's being perceived as union busting. Uh, I think it's a, uh, in the Bronx, I think they have one of their stores that's trying to unionize. Uh, but another thing with REI that I think is interesting, that uh, folks will criticize it because if you want to run for the board, you actually have to be a Fortune 500 executive. So you think, well, aren't co-ops supposed to be this populist, people-oriented thing? And when I heard that, that, one of the first things I thought about was, REI doesn't represent me. But as I really sat on it, I thought, well, there's all these people that are actually dependent on REI. They do pro provide decent retail jobs comparatively. Does some everyday Joe Schmo want to, you know, should we allow that person to run for the board? Maybe we do need to have qualifications. So on the surface, I actually think it's not a bad idea. 
but I, it makes me think, oh, is there a way we can actually <clears throat> onboard people to train them so they can be operating at that level? I think that's one of the missing pieces of the puzzle in this conversation. <clears throat> so, you know, it, so to me, I actually view the corporate form on paper as quite neutral. Uh, and it's not going to determine any of the outcomes, uh, but it does help to structure the outcomes. There's a lot of guidance that's out there. Um, so typically, if you're picking up an investor-owned firm, you're thinking profit. If you're picking up a nonprofit, you're thinking you're just making it work to you know, help out a certain population or whatever. <clears throat> but if we look at this through the lens of economic development, you know, we just passed the, uh, what was that? The Infl Inflation Reduction Act, as they're calling it, at the national level. And really, that's a lot of economic development policy that's in there. And there's an expression of values that the government's going to provide these resources over here, but we're also then going to subsidize to help out investor-owned firms to deliver on government policies over there, right? So what we're doing, again, is we're doing more of this subordination to other kinds of firms, and we have a lot of presumptions about that. So that sets up a lot of what we think the corporation should be doing. Um, Next slide. Now, that said, you know, there's culture that gets us to think about how various corporate forms should operate, but there's also policy. So antitrust and, you know, the regulatory state, it's why you have monopoly electric utilities, for example, but your power bill isn't choking the lifeblood out of you. Uh, public utility commissions are trying to keep the cost down and keep them manageable and essentially tame the monopoly. So it's not as bad. Uh, there's another policy area that a lot of folks don't think about, which is internally to the firm, which is your bylaws and policies. So your bylaws and policies can dictate quite a bit. Uh, one thing I didn't add on here too, it's the actors within the firm. So the CEO, I, I like, you know, again, I use the example of Costco, the uh, founder and then the success, uh, successors at Costco uh, the executives there have really fended off a lot of shareholders from trying to make it where the firm is driving down wages and whatnot. Like this isn't how Costco operates. This isn't how Costco optimizes itself. We don't view ourselves as extracting from our labor force. So actors come into play in setting policy as well. And then, you know, there's other things like the German co-determination model, which allows uh, the labor unions to have a seat at the table on corporate boards. Uh, so there's so many ways that you can mediate the corporate form. It's pretty remarkable when you start thinking about it. Now, when you think about you know, where the strategies come from and the motivations of actors, if a lot of folks will talk about you know, Milton Friedman or they'll talk, you know, who's a professor at University of Chicago, or if they'll talk about uh, Jack Welch, the former CEO of <clears throat> General Electric, then profit is the social mission. If you maximize profit, then everyone's going to benefit. That's the case that they're making. Uh, the findings are otherwise. It doesn't really work out that way. When it comes to nonprofits, one of the taglines that people say with nonprofits is, if you have no margin, no mission. So it means that you say, we're going to deliver X, Y, Z, but we still need to generate some sort of a profit margin in order to keep doing this and to grow what our scope is over time. Another thing that you know, came about, I think, in the 90s and early 2000s is this idea of triple bottom line, people plan a profit. So that's another way to fuse in our values. And you're seeing that with things like the B Corp model that's out there. And then more recently, uh, there's been this conversation around community wealth building, which is kind of the what I'd say the school of thought that I'm more aligned with. And community wealth building, I'd say it's in a nascent stage. A lot of folks are talking about it. Like, it's kind of ready to go and all this. And I would say it's really not quite yet. There's, it's a huge innovative space and um, we need to be working on some things around organizational strategies. But this is, um, you're defined by groups like the Democracy Collaborative, Sustainable Economies Law Center, Democracy at Work Institute, all great folks doing really great things. Uh, I think there's lacking strong organizational strategies and you'll see what I get at when I talk about the electric co-ops. There's no conversations I find with some of the legacy actors that are out there. I'm sure, you know, it, if you don't mind on, on your screens, I'd like to see show of hands. How many of you are members of credit unions? I am, say that. So I'll let that bubble up as uh, people are poking around. But it's a safe, 
credit unions are really well established in the United States. You know, there's over 5,000 of them. And uh, how did they get to that scale? Why aren't we engaging with them to understand what they did in order to become these pretty robust community banking institutions? Uh, how are we going to leverage capital? There's so many different capital mechanisms that are out there. What are we going to do with equity as, as these co companies really grow up? And how do we properly engage stakeholders in the governance of the firm as well? So in, with that, you know, that's where my mind comes back to this issue of ownership. I think that it's great if we can distribute ownership as broadly as possible. But with that, I think when people hear ownership, they think, I have a right to govern. And you see this really acutely in food cooperatives where folks will show up and they'll talk to the person in produce and say, I'm an owner. You should let me figure out how the produce section looks like. No, that's not how this works. You actually have to have separation of ownership from control and you have to have a sophisticated way of having all the diverse interests of the members expressed through that control mechanism. So do we do it in a deep participatory mechanism? Maybe. Is it representative? Representative tends to be the status quo and it works pretty well in many instances. Uh, but you need to relate this to the types of owners and their attributes. So what I think about here is whenever folks will go to a rural area where there's been a lot of decline, uh, educational institutions have been eroded and there's a lot of conspiracy talk. Is it a good idea to have kind of a communal governance system there? I don't think so. You probably want to increase people's skills and capacities to self-govern over time. So you just need to be really aware of that and you think about these things. I think also scale strategies are really important. I see in this space a lot of one and done really cool approaches, but once it's done, once they build a thing, then there's a new competitor that comes from the dot-com space and crushes that cool thing. How do we make these things scale where they can actually compete against the big guys? That's something I think about. Also, you know, in a community wealth building, what's the vision for structural realignment? Just because we create a new worker-owned firm, it doesn't mean that's going to go out and change the world. How does that worker-owned firm intervene in society and in our structures? Now, with that, you know, I want to pivot over to the electric co-ops. And, uh, you know, this is sort of a, uh, a work in progress here of where I'm trying to take my knowledge from the electric co-op sector and communicate to a general audience so people can see how they've scaled. So first, just with co-ops in general, co-ops are absolutely an enormous part of the global economy. Tons of, tons of folks are involved in it. It generates tons of revenue. and It flies under the radar for good reason, I'll say, too. Think about it. an investor-owned firm is representing investors. So they're going to go out and they're going to hype things up. They're going to Elon Musk this stuff as much as they can to increase their share value. A co-op isn't there to increase share value. A co-op is there to serve its members. So what happens is internal to the co-op firm, a lot of the folks that run it think, well, if I go out and hype us up, I'm not really representing the members. That's kind of a logic that I see often. I think that they need to do better about that. So that's just one of my constructive critiques of co-ops there. Now, that said, in the United States, this is a really good infographic I find from a National Cooperative, National Cooperative Business Association. The U.S. is you know, the belly of the beast of capitalism, and we have the biggest co-op sector in the United States. Pretty amazing stuff if you think about it. Now, I want to pivot over to the electric co-ops. The electric co-ops are something I'm incredibly passionate about. So when I started this line of work in 2009, Barack Obama was talking about changing energy policy in the United States for rural economic development. And the idea was, where's all the wind and solar going to go? It's going to go in rural America. And I thought, wow, that's cool. But I'm seeing all these NIMBYs pop up where folks don't want wind farms. And people rejected those folks. Oh, you know, if you don't want a wind farm, you might as well have a coal-fired power plant in your backyard. Do you want that, right? And I started to listen to what some of the folks were saying there, and it made sense, actually, what the NIMBYs were saying, which was these big investor-owned firms are coming to our community, feeding us a, a whole kettle of lies, and they plant, plunk down the wind turbines, and they leave. And then we're stuck with these things and they are not living up to the promise of creating jobs, creating new investment, creating new tax revenues. And they're absolutely correct. 
So the investor owned firms are basically going in and doing their dog and pony show and not delivering what they promise. So in my work, I started looking around and say, are there co-ops that are out there that are doing renewable energy? And is there a community economic development impact in this? Turns out, yes, co-ops do far more with far less in renewable energy, and they should be factored into economic development policy. So with that, I'll start here. The electric co-ops came about with the public power movement in the 19-teens and 1920s. Uh, there were these big investor-owned firms that popped up. They're putting up you know, dirty coal-fired power plants in the middle of communities and places like New York City. And if they weren't putting them there, they're putting them in other population hubs and kind of doing what was called spoken hub. So you have a generator in the middle and you're spidering out your power lines. Well, as they did that, the investor-owned companies were not going into rural areas. It wasn't because they weren't profitable. They weren't profitable enough. The electric utilities were used to getting big, fat profits in these urban areas. Rural areas, the profits would go to 1% to 4%. So the public power movement rose up to say the government needs to get involved and to help uh, rural entrepreneurs form these public purpose companies. So along comes a new deal. 1935 uh, comes the Rural Electrification Act. And then finally, they pass a law, the Rural Electrification Administration, where they actually create a centralized body that helps out rural folks with setting up electric co-ops. Once an electric co-op is set up, they create an industrial strategy and they create a scale strategy. It is absolutely amazing, the history here, and we could totally latch onto that for so much social change. I just really like this image myself here. This is really how they built the electric utilities in rural areas. A lot of barn raisings. Um, as they got more and more sophisticated, they were able to then have, you know, revenue, they had staff, and now they're very professional organizations. Uh, back then in 1930s, 90% of rural America had no power. And from 1935 to 1954, I believe, they completely electrified the American countryside. It was not done with government handouts or subsidies. It was done with low interest loans that rural consumers paid back. And again, I think what an amazing story for public policy. You know, we can empower people through community enterprise and we can actually have government support in a good way that gets paid back. And it's not, again, a subsidy per se. So today, these electric co-ops scale. So you'll have a rural electric co-op that represents 800 people in some areas, which looks like it shouldn't have any revenue. Uh, yeah, Matt, I know every time I hear about the history, I get excited about it. I was actually recounting this to the Minnesota Rural Electric Co-ops, and I was saying, you need to retell this story all the time because you're going to excite people again. They don't know you exist. Um, so what these electric co-ops did is once they set up a small local electric co-op, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll get to that here one second, Ben. They, the electric co-ops then said, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how it is we can make sure we're not beholden to big power providers. How do we create our own power providers? So you'd have 10, 20, 30 electric co-ops coming together to form a co-op of co-ops. And that would be a power generator. Or if not a power generator, they would go out in the market and secure contracts on behalf of the electric co-ops. So now you're taking this it becomes a very sophisticated system of governance where you're scaling up at multiple levels. The system has since become very mature. Uh, they now have two massive uh, banks. Uh, one's called NRUCFC, National Rural Utility Co-op Finance Corporation, and then CoBank. Uh, CoBank is a $160 billion ag and utility co-op bank. So there is capital out there for all this stuff, folks. In our CFC, one of the things they do that's really cool is they'll take the collective lending power of the electric co-ops and they go to Wall Street and they seek out bond offerings. So they actually harness Wall Street to go out and finance rural America. Again, another story that's not told that I think is really cool. But there are ruptures that are happening in the system now. Uh, you know, there's platforms that are starting to come into the utility space. One I think of is Voltus, you know, as an example. And there are collective action challenges and legacies that you know, we can talk about. But I want to make sure that we cover all this. We're coming up on time here. 
as now. And I want to show you this here map, you know, so I'm talking about it. I'm, you need to see some visuals. This is where the electric co-ops are in the United States. So we're talking about renewable energy and we're talking about how it is the Green New Deal or, you know, energy transition can benefit communities. Why aren't we talking about this part of the United States actually owning this infrastructure and you know, benefiting from these public policies? Luckily, the electric co-ops are stepping up and they're trying to be more aggressive in the general public to talk about this. But see, look at the scale of the system, right? Um, it generates $42 billion a year in revenue. And not only do they have things like finance, but they actually have two IT co-ops. I thought the crowd here would really like that. Um, and these IT co-ops, one's called NISC. NISC is based out of Mandan, North Dakota. They're owned by 500 electric co-ops. They do everything from uh, billing services to uh, helping out with uh, distributed energy resources. In terms of economic impact, they're huge. 71,000 jobs. They have a pension fund, which I think is really cool. You know, who has a pension anymore? Uh, Voltus app here. So sorry for the redundancies, folks. So one of the things I did, I said this is in perpetual beta. So try to visualize some of these things. I wanted to let you see the complexity of these things and how they scale. So a local level electric co-op, the way they'll sort this out is if you have 30,000 households, this is a scenario, they might split it up into three districts. So each district represents 10,000 people and you get a vote for one person to represent you on the board. And that board member has one, they, they, were, they serve as one member, one vote. So it's not based on their money, it's not based on their population, on the weight of their vote. They're just one individual on the board. So in this way, you have this kind of more egalitarian structure of the board. Right? Now, what happens is these co-ops here will then go out and they'll form that generation transmission co-op. So now think about the complexity of each one of these local level electric co-ops, right? Each one of these hat is representing 30,000 people, let's say, and they come together and they sort their complex interests and all this into this particular purchasing co-op. A generation transmission co-op from there they'll go to another level all of them come together the purchasing cooperative and the local electric co-op to join up with the it cooperative so these are what you would call polycentric systems they're structured they're nested and all this sort of thing they work very well yeah there's challenges yeah you know they they have a lot of grief you know dealing with things but they work this is how a large part of the electric grid in the United States functions. So with that, you know, I, I want to address Ben's question real quick. Uh, he's saying uh, when you say it wasn't a subsidy, but it was part of the New Deal. Is that because the New Deal is giving out those low interest loans? Yes. Uh, they created a pool of resources, low interest loans. Uh, the cool story, one of the success stories of the electric co-ops is uh, their, uh, what is it? The, uh, the loan loss reserve they had the electric co-ops essentially did not default at all. And they were so successful, the USDA actually, now the uh, Rural Electrification Administration is under USDA. It's called Rural Utility Services. Uh, they now reward them with a loan fund from that loan loss reserve fund because they haven't had to tap it. So that's how successful these electric co-ops have been. So as you think about this, as you think about what y'all are doing in this space, you know, I, I want to give you some prompts to think through. First of all, you know, think about your mission, right? How do the following affect your mission objectives? So think about your ownership and your control. It's like who benefits from the mission? What control should the beneficiaries retain? And what control are beneficiaries willing to relinquish so they can achieve mission objectives? Maybe you do want capital to have some voice. How much voice do you give capital though? That's gonna be a challenge. Think also then about what you're gonna do with your profits, your margins and your residuals. Do they always go back to the members or do you retain them? Do you use them for other things? Good question. What about your general capitalization strategies? Are you going to go out and seek outside capital or are you going to get capital from your members? So one of the things I point out when people talk about the romanticizing worker co-ops, that's great. Awesome. But your capitalization internally is not going to be that much because now you're asking the workers to give up their money. If you have a consumer cooperative, now you can have a bigger pool of folks to go out and pull money from to invest in your firm. So you got to think about those things. Um, 
Also, the way you structure your corporate firm as an investor-owned, an LLC, a co-op, will determine some of the instruments you can use, like bond offerings and debt and this sort of stuff. The other part then is scale. One of the things that in the tech space especially is people think you have to scale. Do you always? You know, I think probably, you know, you do need to scale most of the times, but justify it. Really think, why are we scaling? What is the purpose? And how is it going to affect this mission? And think about how you're going to do that scale. Is it going to be through organic growth of the firm? Is it going to be conglomerating or federation? The electric cooperatives did federation, and it's done really well for them. Then think about how you're going to govern. You know, you need to control for the laws and regulations. Often what I'll hear from folks, they'll come into things like co-ops or social purpose enterprise, and they'll say, sociocracy or kind of Athenian democracy or whatever. Uh, the laws and regulations don't really represent that that well. You can do that, but you need to figure out how it plugs in and adapts to laws and regulations that are out there. Uh, think about also your fiduciary responsibilities. I've seen people run for boards that will say, I'm going to change the co-op. And if they don't do this, I'm going to take the co-op out. Actually, legally, you're not supposed to be running for the board if that's your orientation. And if you're on record for that, board insurance is going to protect you. You can be sued and you could be uh, moved off the board if you get elected with that kind of campaign strategy to serve on the board. So there's some real serious things that people need to think about and not be so glib in doing these things. There's also the stakeholder representation. So, you know, control for capital, controlling for your scale. Once you start scaling, you're going to have different stakeholders popping up. Um, and then finally, what I want to just mention briefly then, you know, I, I said I'm a, I was a research associate at the Ostrom Workshop. I'm still affiliated. Eleanor Ostrom uh, asked a deep question way back in the day, which was, uh, can we actually do democracy? And if so, how? And what she found in her work over the years, carefully done, was not only can we do it, but everyday people are very well adept at doing it if they're willing to dig in. And so in terms of the practice, she developed these design principles uh, and was pulled out of her research for understanding how firms endure over time. Now, it's largely been applied to things like commons and this sort of thing, but there's a lot of applicability to what we're talking about here. So anyway, I've gone on and talked a lot. Uh, yeah, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, so by all means, if folks have questions or thoughts or concerns, pushback, please, I'd love to hear. So I'll stop uh, sharing the screen. Well, that was super exciting and interesting. I can't wait to see what everyone comes up with when we're talking about it a little bit later after the break. Um, but yeah, if you like uh, keep saying, if you have questions or anything, just feel free to jump into the spot here and we'll um, let the queue kind of fill up. So I think Abby's cool. first. Yeah, nice. I think I got everything stable. So if I break up, just signal me or something. Um, but cool. That was really awesome. Um, thank you so much for um, that whole talk. And it was really cool to actually learn more about this evolution of the electric co-ops, like um, definitely something I was not apprised of. So um, my quick question was regarding you say separate ownership and control. And I'm just trying to wrap my head around this in context of um, ownership and control in like radical and just like decentralized networks. Can you just help um, me understand it a little bit more as well? I actually got cut out of the lecture a couple of times. Like how would you uh, define the difference exactly? Is control like the actual explicit decision-making processes and ownership is the, the, the ability to retain like what you said, like profit um, or, or kind of like equity in it? And are you viewing them explicitly as like, uh, is that the difference between it or are you defining it a little bit differently? So maybe if you could just like recap the difference uh, between the two for me, that would be really helpful. Hey, Abby, you, you nailed it very well. Uh, if you want a, a good book for it, Henry Hansman's Ownership mm -hmm. of Enterprise. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes into deep detail on it, but essentially you captured it. Ownership is sort of like you buy your share and it gives you a list of rights. And it really come, ownership comes down to two things the ability to control and the right to residuals or profits. Um, mm -hmm. 
the control rights are usually things like you can run for the board and here's how to have board rights. So it's not explicit up front, like you're going to tell the general manager or CEO what to do. Uh, it's more mm -hmm. like separation. And then the right to residuals is, um, you know, it defines how those profits are going to be distributed once they're in the kitty, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So those are like the two fundamentals of how any firm works. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, so if you say, so if an aspect of ownership is the ability to control and you say separate ownership and control, is it to introduce more uh is this like does that create more space for i guess you could say democratic participatory um governance mm -hmm. if you separate them is that the point it's more meant to do um uh, uh kind of let the experts run things i think is the idea there mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it can be defining more participation but it could also be defining less participation because uh, maybe you actually want a co-op that is represented by experts. That'd be the REI model. Um, mm -hmm. And then REI does all these great things, supposedly. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you figured out, no, we need to have that super deep participatory, and that's what's going to make our co-op have a special value to it. Uh, yeah. So it's it's double the details of how it's related to what your firm strategy is. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, very interesting as it relates to obviously like token voting, <laughs> which is on sure. like basically plutocratic voting where the lines are very um, uh, uh, blurred between that. But I'll let other people ask questions while we have time. Cool. Thanks, Abby. I think Ben's next. Cool. Hey, Keith, thanks again for um, a great talk. I want to understand what the uh, in these electric co-ops, like to what degree was the success of these um, basically due to the, like, uh, sort of fundamental physics. Like, I guess I want to understand why these things were so successful. And I'm wondering if it is to do with, like, some, I don't want to say, like, monopoly, but some notion that, like, you have, one, you probably don't have, like, a huge market of, you know, like, hundred, you know, hundreds or even tens of, like, electric, you know, utility providers in these places. Is that why they were successful is it, or is it just because they were able to get these loans or i don't know hopefully that question makes sense it does you know i think those are really great questions because you know you're right they do have an advantage in their monopoly and no one else is competing against them i would say my counter to that would say like i think that we need to engage with that think about it but these are super sophisticated systems and to me the success is that they took rural agricultural folks and they made them energy engineers and this sort of thing. And these systems have incredible uptime. They're some of the most reliable. They outperform uh, PG&E. Um, so if you look at things beyond just monopoly, the, these indicators are pretty good on them. Uh, another sector that I would point out that's got more competition would be the credit unions. Credit unions are incredibly robust. Uh, they have a similar story on philanthropy where they actually started by Edward Filene, who put his philanthropy into growing the system. So instead of the government, it was philanthropy that helped to start credit unions. And that's another really cool story people don't know about. Similar scale strategy and this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, when I start comparing it to the credit unions, I go, oh, there's similar threads. And for me, that's where I go, uh, there is kind of scalable knowledge that goes across other sectors. And I think it's applicable elsewhere. Does that help Ben? Cool. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're, we're over time, but I think we have time for Devin. Then we can go to break. Is that cool, Connor? Uh, yeah, I I, rec I want to respect everyone's time of, in terms of this lunch break here. Um, but I, if we can wrap it in maybe a minute or two, I feel like uh, that would should be okay. Um, and if people do have to leave at this moment, we understand that, and you will not be penalized anyway. This is being recorded, so this question will... I can be answered for you um, kind of retroactively as needed, but uh, I'd say uh, go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, th thank you for the, the lecture. It was great. And sorry, we're going a bit over time. Um, I, I have a question because the the ecosystem that uh, the Uniswap Foundation would support is a very, you know, like has dozens of different kinds of stakeholders. And I'm thinking through, you know, the challenge of ensuring that all interests are represented and that you know, thoughtful discussion can happen to ensure, like, I want to prevent decisions being made in a way that has short-term benefits for one group. Um, today, it's probably the, you know, those who have the most capital. 
um, at risk of harming others who have less voting rights, but whose long-term support and contributions are integral to the support of the ecosystem. So I'm wondering if you've seen any um, kind of co-ops or any any groups of um, you know many different kinds of stakeholders kind of coming together, and what systems have maybe been been put in place to um, you know in, ensure that you know interests are are thoughtfully um, you know aligned and um, like what systems and processes should I be thinking about and looking looking at? Uh, Devin, I think that's a great question and one that like. I can't give you any hard answers on that because I'd say the kind of complexity that y'all are dealing with is kind of next level in many ways. Um, but really there's a lot to learn from the investor owned firm here where they've created multiple shareholder classes and they do have to respond to them. Even if some people have weighted voting rights, uh, a lot of these companies will actually give voice to the shareholders that have lower weight. Um, so I think there's actually some cues there to look at, shareholder owned firms, investor owned firms. Um, another would be to look at these multi-scale co-op systems. So the electric co-ops at multiple scales. So for your question, I wouldn't look at the local electric co-ops so much as the GNTs and the state associations, because now not only are you dealing with individual people, but you're dealing with organizations of different kinds at different levels, and they're all serving in the same boardroom. And I've sat in those boardrooms and it's really cool to see how they interact. And it's remarkable how good faith they really are. What falls apart, I'll, I'll give you one observation I have though. What falls apart is when they go back to their offices and they start thinking of all the nefarious things the other people might be working on. And truth be told, there's not a lot of nefari nefarious behavior going on. And I just go, what the hell is going on, folks? Like, why do you think this of your peers? Like, you actually go out and you have your steak dinners with them whenever you're meeting up with them and you're enjoying yourself. You have your microbrew and all this. And then when you go back to your corners, you're like, well, that association we share together, I'm worried this other person's gaming it. Dude, you hung out with Bob the other night and you got along with him. What are you doing here, you know? And so thinking of those kind of human things that come into play, um, even in a sophisticated organization where a lot is at stake and people are making good paychecks and all this, humanity creeps in and you just gotta be aware of that. Um, so yeah, this is great y'all. Um, so Connor, are we, are we doing break for 30 minutes and coming back uh, to- Yeah, it's gonna be, um, we're gonna be on lunch break now. It'll actually be, uh, we'll come back at 1230. So it'll be just about an hour now, um, just under. Uh, and really great discussion. And I think we'll be continuing exploring a lot of these ideas um, in the afternoon uh, workshop together. So looking forward to that. Great. And